Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Debbie Kleiman, and I'm the executive director of the Blank Center for Entrepreneurship here at Babson College. Tonight, we gather to recognize an incredible entrepreneur who, through his talent, vision, leadership, and tireless effort, has built some amazing companies and truly impacted our world. This year's Academy of Distinguished Entrepreneurs inductee, Dean Metropolis, is an accomplished entrepreneur with a global vision and local ties. As many of you may know, Dean grew up in the Boston area and is a double Babson alum, having received his BS and his MBA from Babson College. It's really thrilling to have you back on campus, Dean. Welcome. As the newest member of ADE, Dean will be in great company. Since 1978, the Academy has recognized and welcomed many of the world's most highly respected entrepreneurs to its ranks. Members of the Academy of Distinguished Entrepreneurs have created and developed companies of all sizes and across all industries. They have achieved uncommon success with a seemingly simple formula each capitalized on the need for change and took action to make an impact. They have also inspired generations of entrepreneurs to follow in their footsteps and find new ways to create solutions to the world's biggest challenges. They have created tens of millions of jobs around the world and transformed countless lives. It is my pleasure to welcome Dean members of his family, and some members of his team from Metropolis and Company to celebrate Dean's induction into the Academy of Distinguished Entrepreneurs. And we look forward to hearing from Dean and learning about his entrepreneurial journey during this special evening. I'd also like to take a moment and welcome our members of governance who are here tonight, Babson leadership and Babson alumni. Will you please stand and be recognized? And a special welcome to Marla Capozzi, MBA 1996, our chair of the Board of Trustees, whom you will hear from after dinner. So please enjoy your dinner and get to know your fellow guests at your table. We'll return after dinner for the induction ceremony and Dean's remarks. And last, we have a welcome, a very special welcome, from President Kerry Healy. Thank you. Good evening and hello from South Africa. I wish I could be there tonight for this exciting event as we welcome Dean Metropolis to the Academy of Distinguished Entrepreneurs. The Academy of Distinguished Entrepreneurs is the world's first entrepreneurship hall of fame, and it includes more than 100 notable business figures. Dean, your leadership and contributions will only enhance the caliber of this impressive group. You are an accomplished and respected business leader, entrepreneur, and philanthropist, and I'm thrilled to recognize you with one of Babson's highest honors. You epitomize the kind of entrepreneurial leader that Babson strives to educate. Your professional achievements at the helm of Metropolis and Company are matched only by your personal generosity and impact. Dean, Thank you for being an important part of the Babson community. Congratulations and welcome to the Academy of Distinguished Entrepreneurs. Please welcome Babson Board of Trustees Chair, Marla Capozzi. Thank you. Um, good evening. This is uh, an amazing evening, and it has been fantastic to see everyone. Um, it's my honor with the Babson community tonight to induct Dean Metropolis into the Academy of Distinguished Entrepreneurs. It's a particularly special evening given that he's returned home and that we get to induct a double Babson alum. I had to say that again just up here because we're so proud. Thank you. 
And thank you for letting us honor you this evening um, and for bringing your family, family as well. Um, as many of you will see and have read, um, Dean has founded a reputable investment firm, Metropolis and Company, where he also works with his sons. Under, the, entre, under his entrepreneurial leadership, Metropolis and Company has turned around and transformed more than 80 global organizations and brands, many of which you're familiar with. Most recently, he is known as the man who saved the Twinkie. So, and, and I said this to him, whether you enjoy Twinkies on a regular basis or not, we are thankful that you have saved the Twinkie for all of us, for all of our sakes. Dean and his family are also active philanthropists. Um, his family has supported veterans, education, medical research, and the like, along with the campaign for ch to end childhood hunger, as well as the home for, uh, hole in the wall gang, um, as well camps for children with cancer. Last year, Dean and his wife Marianne signed the Giving Pledge. For those of you familiar with it, this is the Bill Gates and Warren Buffett pledge that uh, 14 others, I believe, 14 other families have have agreed to donate the majority of their wealth to philanthropic causes. Nearly 100 years ago, ba Roger Babson founded this college on the premise to educate business leaders differently. He believed and even required at the time students to pledge that they would embark on a business career as a means of rendering service to humanity. Throughout his career, Dean's integrity, compassion, and entrepreneurial leadership is a role model for all of us in this pledge, to, even today. Tonight, we celebrate Dean's achievements and his impact and honor him as the newest member of the Distinguished Academy of Entrepreneurs. Before we turn the, the mic over to Dean, and he promises um, that he's not quite sure when he's going to get off, so I hope you all get a cup of coffee before he gets started. Um, please, please turn your attention to the video screen before we bring him to the stage. He who works with his hands, his head, and his heart is an artist. Anyone who has had the pleasure to know Dean over the course of his career knows that he has become an extraordinary artist. His canvas is the food and beverage industry. His colors are the brands he has chosen. And his brush strokes are the creativity and passion that he brings to each new recreation of forms that we once had known but have since forgotten. He has brought new life to tired products and found ways to rekindle in consumers a joy for the brands that had escaped their consciousness. Dean Metropolis Entrepreneur. It's an unusual breed of an individual, a risk taker, but understanding risk. Being able to balance the needs of the customers, suppliers, employees, and technology all in one. Successful in multiple efforts, not just one, that is the true test of an entrepreneur. Many individuals have been able to build one company but not been successful in others. From deal to deal, Dean has been fantastic in pulling it all together, inspiring his teams, working incredibly hard to find different ways to create value for his investors. And in doing so, he has become himself an icon of American entrepreneurialism. I was having a conversation with Dean, and we were talking about his kids, his children. And, um, and he's really been wonderful mentoring his children and getting them involved in his um, entrepreneurial um, business activities. And uh, he was describing to me um, what guidance that he gives them as it relates to their involvement in business. Uh, and there was two things uh, that he mentioned. One was always make your decisions based on business fundamentals, uh, and then make sure all your actions are consistent with uh, integrity and compassion. Uh, so, um, so I think he has been a very unique example in terms of being enormously successful, um, but, but consistently being a great human being. I've had the honor to be involved with a thousand entrepreneurs. 
And one thing I learned is they were not in it for the money. They had passion for an idea. They had the passion to turn around and build a company. And Dean Metropolis has that passion. And I am honored to call him my friend and a great entrepreneur. Please join me in welcoming Dean Metropolis. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Marla, thank you. Marla is trying to keep me scripted, but it's not going to work. <laughs> so thank you all for being here. I hadn't quite seen these videos there. The, I thank these gentlemen as well, and I thank you all for participating in our celebration this evening. I, I wasn't sure what I was going to talk about. I do give a number of speeches, this uh, talks, I should say. Um, this uh, summer, I gave a presentation and talk in Europe on technology, if you can believe it. I I'm very passionate about the subject and how it's impacting the world from factory flo floors and robotics to genomics and genetic sequencing and, and just massive data matching and sequencing. So it's a wonderful subject. But I thought I would discuss my journey in my life and how I got here and what I'm doing. And, and hopefully that touches some of the younger people. As, and hopefully it's an inspiration. If nothing else, it's at least informative. Um, anyway, I was very pleased and proud to be a Babson alumni. I was here in 67, 68, finished 67, 68. Uh, right after that, I started working with Xerox. They had given me a fellowship for a doctorate at the University of Rochester and an analyst at Xerox that was the headquarters at the time. And I spent a year there. And it was very challenging for me because I wasn't really connecting with uh, Xerox and financial analysis and operations research at the University of Rochester. So I moved down to New York at Columbia University. And I got a wonderful job with, and you know, destiny plays a role. And I, before I even start on a journey, what made the difference in my journey is, first of all, whether it's God, it's a, it, we're blessed with something that energy and, and, and your health, and nothing can really replace that. Success starts with that as a basis. Uh, I'm very grateful to my parents um, who just gave me confidence and love and didn't shackle me with expectations that even though my dad wanted me to be a doctor, um, <laughs> They, they didn't shackle me and impose that on me, so I was allowed to be free and pursue my curiosity. And my brother and my sister here, my wife has got pneumonia, she's in LA, and my two sons, and I know they're looking forward to, to hearing about this, but they're a very important part of my life. So that's what's made my life comfortable. But my early career with GT&E in New York connected in a way that I didn't expect. I was a young analyst in GT International that was a two and a half billion dollar part of a 48 billion dollar large business public company. It, it operated in about 62 countries. I'm a young analyst in New York, 909 Third Avenue. And I first started traveling a lot in Latin America. We had a 50% joint venture in Buenos Aires in, in Argentina on the telephone company, Mexico the same. We had lighting businesses. We bought Philco home entertainment throughout South America. And it just, and by the way, it was always a challenge because at that time and before something called Brenton, Brenton Woods that stabilized currencies, currencies like the Cruzeiro, which was the Brazilian currency, the peso in Argentina, the peso in Mexico, they would devalue 60% a month. And it was always frustrating for us at GT&E because we reported in dollars and we were operating in local currency and we would do very well in local currency. But at the end of the year, when the parent company had to report earnings or each quarter, the, in the US dollars, it was always a challenge. Then Brenton Woods stabilized currencies was one. So anyway, um, so, it, so it was the most exciting part of my life to join as GT&E International. It was sort of an afterthought for GT&E, but it was a very vibrant company, entrepreneurial. Um, and I started to travel in Europe. And, and when I was 25, the 
senior VP of finance in Europe was leaving, had a, was moving back to the U.S. So I threw my hat in the ring to be the VP of finance for Europe. And the president who really had taken a shine to me, I was his analyst and I used to travel in the private plane and I would prepare him for budget meetings and so forth. I asked him, I said, I'd like to be the CFO of Europe. He says, gee, son, he says, you're 25 years old. There's no way. <laughs> so I, I said, gee, I'm, I'm going to have to leave if I don't get a shot at that because I've been working and, you know, you've encouraged me. So, again, maybe it's destiny or not. He sort of said, why don't we give the kid a shot? So I got a shot at the job. And I had a magnificent CFO of Europe. We had factories all over. We had a lighting business. We had a television home entertainment business. We had a telecommunications business. We had offices that telecom was in Milano. I lived in Geneva, but traveled. I first moved to Paris. Zurich was our home entertainment base. And I would travel 30 days a month for 11 years of my first time my career. I loved history. I would study Wagner. And we had a factory in Erlang in Germany where Wagner was born, in Nuremberg and, and München. Um, we had plants in Stockholm. I would go up to the Lapland and celebrate uh, a Midnight Sun on June 21st with my girlfriend, Marianne, at that time. Um, <laughs> my, the, my early friends around the world tried to make me a tango dancer in Argentina. I played polo in Buenos Aires, and, and I loved the history of Africa, and I would travel into Africa, Middle East. Uh, when I was 28, GT&E just completed this magnificent integrated telecommunication system for Iran. And we celebrated it. We had two subcontractors, Nippon from Japan and Siemens from Germany. And I was 28, and I'm in, and by the way, I used to do a lot of communications at the time with the U.S. government, the State Department, a couple of agencies. So I would travel to Tehran, and they, they celebrated their 2,200th anniversary in, in, of, of the Persian Empire and Persepolis. And GT&E turned on a very integrated telecommunication system, which was one of the best in the Middle East for many, many decades. And I was just sitting about eight seats away from the Shah of Iran. And I remember used to interact with a fellow that used to work for Kissinger. And uh, I would tell him about something's got to moderate. The Shah had a, an organization called the Savak. And it was like the Gestapo or Beria for Stalin. And they would take off and I could see going into the airport, they would take young students who, was, who were demonstrating in London or in the US and they would just arrest them. So I would try to, to push for moderation, but it's very difficult. I learned very difficult to moderate political change. Unfortunately, it often happens very abruptly, but any, I don't want to get down to that path. So those early years were remarkable, but then I could see some trends. I saw a movie, um, <clears throat> Enemy at the Gates with KKR, with RJR and Nabisco, and I said, gee, I had made seven acquisitions for gt and &E around the world. And by the way, again, we used to have a joint venture in India in lighting. And uh, Rashid Gandhi, who was Indira, Indira Gandhi's son, she was assassinated, she was the prime minister. I, subsequently, he was assassinated, was my good friend, was about two or three years older. We used to have a lot of fun because he was single in those days too. And he was assassinated, unfortunately. But it was that, my love of history and these relationships around the world truly are the, the core of my pleasure and fun in business. Um, but anyway, I could see private equity was beginning to emerge as something very special, and I was doing fantastic at gt &E. I was their youngest senior vice president at 31. I mean, everybody wanted me to continue, but I said, I got to try this. I got I to gotta figure this out. And I had met a guy named Harry Gray, who was the chairman and CEO of United Technologies. The most popular CEO of the time, he was very acquisitive, and he was trying very hard to get me to work for United Technologies up in Hartford but I wanted to pursue something totally unusual with, United, with uh, private equity. So I bought an early cheese business, and it was cheese business, very tough commodity, but we chose all the niche cheeses in the country. We controlled almost all of them, 14 acquisitions. Bankers Trust became our early partners, um, and we did very well. The first time I felt some major millions coming my way, and it was a lot of fun to see it, but it was not that important in itself, just like Mike Milken. Uh, said, in itself, money is not 
fun. I mean, you, you, what do you do with it? You know, you fulfill things you like to do. So um, we sold that cheese business, and we just started a career. We're 82 companies later in Europe, like Mexico, Canada, the U.S. Um, there were a few industrial businesses, but mostly we developed a skill set and in a concentration around um, brands and beverage businesses like um, Mom and Perrier Jouet in France. Uh, Paps, my sons bought Paps about six, seven years ago. I uh, sold it about two and a half, three years ago. Um, and the other particular pleasure for me, my brother helped me in the operational part of some of the factories we used to take over, but my sons were a very important part of me. From the age of 14, they would work with me and they would really bring a totally diff different perspective in some of the brands. I remember we bought a company from a company called American Home Products, a huge pharmaceutical company. And they had a food division, about two and a half billion dollars in them. And the biggest brand in, those, in that food division was Chef Boardy. Now what the hell do you do with Chef Boardy? Tell me. So, and it, it, it had Pam cooking spray, Goulden's mustard, which was featured with uh, Jennifer Aniston and Kevin Bacon. They got, they've done tremendous things in getting brands with, with, uh, with uh, celebrities. So Chef Boardy kept declining at 8% a year. Here's a billion and a half dollar brand declining 8% a year. And I, all my marketing people, what are we going to do? And by the way, from the age of 13, 14, my kids would always come to meetings. Luckily, I had a plane always, and so they would come and they'd listen to my frustration at time, would come and walk in Greenwich, Connecticut, walk around the pool and talk about. So I didn't know what to do with Chef Bordy. We inherited two ads when we bought it. They cost each $840,000. It was three uh, young college students who were lost in the Colombian jungle, and luckily, in their knapsack, they had three Chef Boyardees with a new flip-top can. And boy, <laughs> they survived. Um, so those are the ads. But the decline continued at 8% a year, and I'm frustrated. So one day, the kids, probably 16, 14, 15, were driving up from Greenwich to Boston. So one of them says, Dad, WWF, which is the headquarters along 95. So I said, so what? What do you mean, our demographic? I said. What are you talking about? Okay. So Monday they take this fellow Bob Sperry, a friend of someone here, and one of our lawyers, they go up and they say, we want to see Vince McMahon. And the lady says, uh, what can I do for you? Well, we, we own Chef Boyardee and we want to do a partnership. Well, Linda was very available, Linda McMahon. So they, and we created this great partnership with WWF. And we would get uh, The Rock, who used to come, used to live in Florida, He'd come and stay at the house. Poor Marianne always had to accommodate. He would do ads for $125 at their Stanford, Connecticut um, uh, studios. We would use The Rock within those, that price. Uh, Mankind, uh, Cold Stone, uh, Stone someone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and all of a sudden, we started to use The Hungry Man and with, with these big celebrities who were hugely popular. And we would put jumbo meatballs for the hungry teen. And the brand started to grow 4%. We went public. ConAgra bought it. It's the, one of the best brands. They bought Pam, cooking sprays. So that was the type of marketing that transformed many of those brands. One last example. Paps was their company. They bought that a few years ago. And the brand, they created something called um, guerrilla marketing the ultimate guerrilla marketing. They hired 37 young people who had girlfriends plus a lot of friends, so they paid the pay 37 were on the payroll, but they had huge impact. And you couldn't go to Vail, Aspen, Jackson Hole, Deer Valley without all those kids running the, the operating the lines wearing Pabst hats. It was the coolest thing. Wall Street, kids in Wall Street would be wearing Pabst hats. It was, became a cool brand. And uh, how they would do it, um, I was telling a little story here. Um, the ads would cost on, on, on Super Bowl three or four years ago. I was uh, conveying the story. The ads would cost $37 million a minute. Budweiser, Chrysler. And the night after Super Bowl, at the end of the CNN session, John King says, ads this year top $37 million a minute for, for the Super Bowl. This ad cost $2,700, and 
and it got 60 million hits compared to six or seven for these others. So it goes, the CNN goes dark for about three, four seconds. And then you see Will Ferrell walking up this wheat field and uh, for $2,700 he did it. And then he gets thrown a can of beer and he says, forget those beers, this is my beer. The tweets went wild. The same the year afterwards, Will Ferrell is in Amsterdam. And he's sitting on a wall along the canal and he's drinking his beer. And he says, these beers here, bitter and dark. I said, I can't, what? Thank God I brought my own six pack. I'm enjoying it. <laughs> the, these people, he said, don't know what they're doing. Every sign is Ausfahrt, A U S F A H R T, which means exit in German, Dane, Dutch. So he says, if people keep advertising Aus Fart, he says, no wonder they don't know anything about beer. <laughs> so it just had huge things. And lastly, there was a major, I'm not gonna mention her name, um, one of the top vocalists in the world. She had a concert in Miami. And um, after the concert, they had a, a little after party at the Delano Hotel. And at the back of the Delano, they had a roped off area and she's walking down and all the photographers on each side. And we got an invitation to our young field marketer and his girlfriend. So he's sitting next to the rope and there's this very high profile lady who's walking down. He puts a can of paps in front of her she thought it would hit her, so she reaches out like this. His girlfriend takes a picture of that can, and she says, whatever her name, loves Pabst. It, it <laughs> tweeted all over the world. It was, and that cost us absolutely. So that was the transformative. <laughs> but what is very important that has made at least our brands work, yes, a lot of those innovative, high, um, very creative marketing campaigns, there's a focus and discipline that has to go with this entrepreneurship. There has to be probably the number one element that has allowed us to succeed in our businesses is introducing systems. We're always amazed when we buy big businesses that management, macro managers, they have good knowledge, general financial information, but if you ask them to talk about profitability by order, by its account, by SKU, how much inventory by SKU, how much write off they don't have that detail. And like Costas, which went into chapter seven, had nothing. I mean, no wonder they had filed chapter 11 twice before. Um, they had none of this. And putting systems in that drives your decisions, allows you to be disciplined and hold your organization accountable is very critical to, to a success. On then innovation and then creative marketing. Um, so that combination is the magic that, uh, that makes things work for us. Out of the 82, I think one of the questions that I was asked earlier, had you had any setbacks or disappointments? I, I should tell you, luckily no. Um, you know, have we had setbacks in terms of things not working quite like we expected? Yes, but on the other hand, we understood, we focused on consumer and some industrial businesses, so we always knew how to weave and bob, re redirect the business, but the most important element for success is building a culture with your management, and that's often when we buy businesses, we terminate the top guys very quickly. You create a culture of hunger, accountability, results. We used to have a sign, leave the explanations outside the door, come in with the results, and so, it's that hunger and results orientation that has made these businesses work and the culture that really, when we make acquisitions and integrate them, it happens quickly if you really change the top culture. And because there are a lot of bright young people underneath who want to become much more enthusiastic, they want to have, and by the way, they become owners, we've made a lot of millionaires with equity uh, in a lot of these businesses, but, it is that hunger that you need to fill and hold people accountable and allow them to, part of it is discipline, part of it is innovation, but also some instinct that has to drive the performance. So uh, anyway, that's, um, that's what uh, has brought us here today and uh, we've enjoyed the journey and it's been a lot of fun. Um, I can't say that we've had a lot of stress in, in the journey. Uh, it gets. The thing that gets more stressful now is more legality, more regulatory stuff, more 
complications on devoting time to more complicated things other than growing businesses and innovating them and all of that. And that's more, more it has gotten more and more complicated in, re in recent years. Probably two things that are driving the world today are technology, phenomenal, and financial engineering, starting from venture capital, hedge funds, private equity, and then conventional banking. There isn't an idea in the world that can't find excess to capital, they might have to give up some equity, that allows it to get early capital to take the risk with those ideas and let them blossom. So financial engineering and technology are phenomenal things. The two big problems for the U.S. is our education system, and I do work closely with the Gates Foundation with charter schools, and secondly, it's... Um, the, it, it, the second part of it is there's a, recently with Mike Milken, who's by the way another wonderful gentleman, we work closely with medical research with them. We had a conference in the Hamptons and we talked about opioids. 40 plus million people in op suffer. I didn't have even heard of opioids three or four years ago. And I'm, I'm shocked, and there's an isolation that's happening with a lot of our young people, and easy prescriptions and all of that. So somehow our society is going through a big phase that I find very troublesome, and I also think that um, education has to be really improved, and there's a lot of total transformation that has to take place there. The two things that I want to move forward to, and I my sons won't let me because they have too many business demands, um, that they have me chasing with them. I wanna do more in philanthropy. What I do with philanthropy, I don't enjoy as much. I, um, I don't enjoy it because it's hard for me to impact it. I always like results, and these, some of these, these philanthropic issues are very long-term. It's education, ultimately, that resolves the problem of, that you need, and they take a long time. And so, and the other thing I have, direct impact of myself and sustainability. It's easy to feed and, uh, you know, the, the campaign, my wife helped start the campaign to end childhood hunger. It was wonderful to feed thousands of young people. The only meal was the one meal they got at school. So these are programs to give them at least a meal in school. But how do you sustain it? How do you move to the next generation that gets its own ability to survive? That's a real challenge that I have found with philanthropy, philanthropy to fulfill me. And uh, I'm very proud to be part of this giving pledge. Marianne and I have signed this very happily. At least 80% of our estate and wealth will go to philanthropy, and we can't change it's a contract at this point. Uh, and so I'm working today. I continue to work. I enjoy it. So does, And all that should go to the philanthropic causes that uh, we, we believe in. The other thing that's very dear to me, and I've I'm sorry, actually, that Lori wouldn't bring that up. About two years ago, I gave a talk in L.A. that was very, very well received, um, if I say so myself. <laughs> um, and I got a book from Ted Turner on the population and its impact on our globe. Um, phenomenal book. And its population is impacting our world tremendously. Um, I'll tell you just a very quick synopsis. In 1805, there were a billion people in our world. In 1930, that's a long time afterwards, there were two billion people. In 1965, there were three billion people. Today, seven and a half billion people. And in just 35 years, 35 years, there'll be nine and a half billion people. A couple other things. People are living a lot longer from like 53, 50 years ago, 53 to 87, 88, and getting in fact, there was a sign outside of MIT about three years ago. It says, the child born today will live to be, I think it said 120 or something. Uh, so they're living longer. In the past 15 years, we've created 2.2 billion people in the middle class. <clears throat> the problem with that is middle classers, and they consume more. More cars, more leather, more shoes, more clothes, more forests getting depleted, um, resources getting depleted, food supplies, water. Our forests are, are getting decimated around the world. The most magnificent gift of, from nature to all of us is the Amazon forest in Brazil. Magnificent forest. I was lucky many years ago to go up to Brasilia and then I went to the Amazon. And 
42% of that forest is gone and, and rapidly depleting fast. Glaciers around the world are melting. The most magnificent, the Himalayas, I remember I was 27, 28, my first trip to the Himalayas, I couldn't believe it. I used to hear stories, I used to make up stories in my own head about what that could be. 60% of the Himalayas glaciers are gone. They feed a billion people through the Yangtze in this river, the Yellow River, and gone. The Alps, the Andes, and the Rockies, 42% gone. Deserts are expanding incredibly. In this population in, in Africa that we talked about, there are a billion people in Africa today. In just 35 years, it's going to be 2.2 billion people. 2.2 billion. Now they have four deserts. The Sahara, and I've traveled them. The Kalahari in the south, the Suhail in the middle, and Namibia on the west. <coughs> the Suhail Desert alone is expanding at 1,400 square miles a year. And the population is going to go from a billion to 2.2 billion people in just 35 years. So you wonder, what is going to happen? All the developed countries, Europe, Japan, um, China, ourselves in the US, population zero to slight declines, in fact, in some. But in the more developing world, the population is still expanding. Bangladesh, India, and Pakistan, about a billion one today, it'll be 2.2 billion dollars and 2.2 <laughs> billion people in just 35 years. So that population is a major issue. I have some dear friends and one of my dearest and I love to see you recognize him actually. His name is Peter Diamandis. He's uh, partners with, um, with um, and he, he has the X Factor that sends people out to space. He's written two books not too long ago called Bold and Abundance. Uh, in fact, two years ago, he received this magnificent uh, technology award. Of he, I was very pleased to, to help to be with him. Um, and he says, Dean, you worry too much about it. Technology is going to change everything. In fact, you're worried about food supply and population and water. But we won't need all that land. We've got vertical farming and warehouses where you can provide. So the world is changing. Uh, Technology is making things easier in many ways, but it's isolating a lot of people who can't understand it, who can't keep up with it. Um, the landscape is going to change. Uh, yeah, we might not suffer from water shortage. Um, and by the way, desalination technology is there, and we can desalinate oceans and bring them into the deserts. Economically, it's not that viable today. Uh, fossil fuels are becoming, coal is going to be extinct. I know Trump is making a big deal of it. In the next 10, 15 years, it's, it, it just doesn't, economically, it doesn't pay. Uh, solar energy is expanding dramatically. Um, uh, look at cars, self-driving cars. The big challenge there is finding batteries that, that can they can keep um, the solar energy uh, long enough to, to, and the battery technology is changing very quickly. We'll see that in the next three to four years. So the technology is changing and I think will make life a lot easier, but I'm still challenged by the lack of education, resources that are diminishing, the timing of everything balancing out between technology and the impact on the world as we know it today. So anyway, these are things that I would like to commit a big part of my life going forward if I can somehow disengaged a little more from business, which I enjoy very much, I'm passionate about, and too many people chasing me for it. So with that, I thank you all very much. And uh, Thank you, Dean. Um, your hunger, passion, uh, has, and curiosity uh, seems to only keep growing over the years. So it's an inspiration to us all. Um, so I'd like to um, read the citation for your induction into the Academy of Distinguished Entrepreneurs. In recognition of the outstanding achievements that have earned for you the admiration and high esteem of the society which you serve, this testimonial citation is presented to C. Dean Metropolis, Chairman and CEO of Metropolis and Company, on the occasion of your induction into the Academy of Distinguished Entrepreneurs this Thursday, November 9th, 2017. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you so much, Dean. That was an amazing talk, and I, I really felt like we were along with you for the ride um, that you've had. It's, it's really, truly extraordinary. At Babson, as many of you know, we are focused on preparing entrepreneurs of all kinds to lead in a new way, creating social and economic value simultaneously, and in doing so, transforming lives, businesses, and communities for the better. Our honored guest and his fellow members of the Academy of Distinguished Entrepreneurs exemplify this ideal, and we thank them for their leadership. Tomorrow morning, here on campus, we'll gather again to kick off the Babson Entrepreneurship Forum, our MBA student-led full-day conference on entrepreneurship. The first event of the day will be a fireside chat with Dean and Marla, where you'll hear more about Dean's remarkable entrepreneurship journey and lots of really good stories. Following that session, the forum will continue with an exciting day full of breakout sessions and panels, discussions with leading entrepreneurs about making an impact in our rapidly changing world through entrepreneurship, just as Dean has showed us that he has done. I hope that you will be able to join us. I want to take a moment to thank all the people that helped make this beautiful evening come to life and really what allowed us to celebrate Dean's amazing accomplishments in style. Thank you. So that is our evening for tonight. Thank you all so much for coming. Good night.